Welcome to the Simply Vegan podcast with me, Holly Johnson, and my co-host, Gabriella Clark. Each week, we discuss the latest vegan news, taste test new products, and chat to some of the leading names in veganism. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Simply Vegan podcast. We have some fantastic news this week. We are the number one podcast in the food category in South Africa and number six in the UK. So hello to all our South African listeners and thank you so much for listening. Um, I feel bad that we're always waffling on about, you know, all the British supermarkets. We maybe need to diversify a little bit. I know, maybe we should. I'm sad that that's as close as I'm going to get to South Africa probably for a while, but that's if that's as much travel as I can do, I'll take it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think there's a real revolution going on over there with veganism, which is amazing. So yeah, um, thank you to the South Africans. And um, obviously number six um, in the UK is pretty good too. So thank you, everyone. And please do head over to iTunes to give us a review. Um, we'd love to hear, you know, what do you want us to talk about? Do you love hearing our taste tests? Do you want to hear more news stories do you want recipes head over there give us some stars preferably five (laughs) and um yeah give us a review so this week we wanted to first of all mention the amazing news that the uh, nestle are launching kit kat v um you've probably seen this in the news very exciting um what do you think gabriella Oh, Holly, how do you do? You even need to ask my thoughts on this. <laughs> Brilliant. Again, I'm all for anything that makes a vegan option of a classic or a favorite available to as many people as possible. We can, you know, rave all we want about the amazing vegan chocolates that are out there, and there are amazing chocolates like Vago and. Um, Love Raw and other brands like that but they're never as easy to come across as the the big Nestle brands and so um, you know maybe that gets the vegan option to more people then it's it's a good thing good thing I think. I do agree I mean there is the argument and you know I know a lot of vegans raise this argument that we should be supporting the smaller vegan brands Um, and not buying from big dairy giants, you know, um, like Nestle. Um, But I think, yeah, I agree with you. I think anything that can bring veganism to the mainstream is a good thing. Um, You know, it's, it's about as many people as possible, I think, with, you know, in terms of climate change, Mm. um, and, you know, and saving the lives of animals, I think the more people that can can switch or or even just cut down on their dairy and uh, meat is a brilliant thing. I saw you shared something on your uh, personal social channels this weekend about it's not a handful of people doing veganism perfectly, but lots and lots of people doing it as best they can. Um, and for me, that really rings true. And that's definitely my approach and the approach I would love to see from others as well is, you know, you can't always be the most perfect raw plant-based whole food vegan life and money and budget and accessibility gets in the way and yes in an ideal world I would a hundred percent of the time be supporting small brands sometimes when you pop into your local corner shop with a friend to grab a snack those brands just aren't there yet so the more option there is um the better I think yeah, 100%. So we've got Easter coming up and hopefully, you know, restrictions are going to start to be eased a little bit. Perhaps we might be able to see some people. We're not sure yet. Um, <laughs> but, you know, this if you say you did for January and you're quite new to veganism, you might be thinking, well, how am I going to go without my, you know, dairy milk Easter eggs. Um, I used to be, oh, I used to be terrible. I'd buy all my Easter eggs because I've got loads of nieces and nephews. I'd buy them all, put them in the cupboard, and then I would just eat them. 
like in the run up to <laughs> Easter and then I'd have to go out and buy them all again. I'm so different now. I think because I only eat dark chocolate, it's because it's just not full of sugar, is it? So you don't tend to eat as much and it's it's actually much healthier because obviously it's got higher cacao content. Um, and I'm not just devouring whole Easter eggs in one go <laughs> that are like a pound, you know, sort of cheap, cheap chocolate. Uh, yeah, I mean, the the old Easter eggs that I used to buy, there's definitely something that makes chocolate taste better and more exciting when it comes in in the shape of an Easter egg. So um, true. <laughs> and I don't know why that is. <laughs> but yeah, the the richness, I suppose, and the intensity of a dark chocolate just means that you can't devour them in quite the same way though I do give it a good go yeah so we're going to be taste testing some vegan eggs over the coming weeks um so make sure you tune in each week to um to hear them so first of all we taste tested the range from Hotel Chocolat now these are not cheap but they are extremely good quality and made with ethical, uh, sustainable cacao. So, you know, that's what you're paying for with these eggs. Um, what did you think of them? I I totally agree for some of them. They are not a cheap Easter egg compared to the ones you might be used to picking up in your local supermarket, but they definitely have the wow factor. I feel like I can't not lead with talking about the extra thick rare and vintage easter egg which came in a beautiful uh white tin had this beautiful dark chocolate easter egg inside and then within that um chocolate covered nuts raisins and their signature i suppose they're like batons of fruit and nut chocolate yeah so even though i mean it's 31 pounds that's definitely quite a investment for an easter egg but you know if you're gifting it to somebody who you love or you really want to treat yourself the wow factor is there with this one not just in terms of the unboxing but the taste as well I think Incredible. you'd have, I think you'd really have to love them wouldn't you to spend 30 pounds on an easter egg for them but it like you say this is luxury it's a real decadent treat and the eggs are so thick I mean I could hardly break them up so thick we um we opened it on Friday evening and uh, kind of cracked it in half split all the the bits inside evenly to the point where we were counting out chocolate covered nuts so that <laughs> nobody got more than the other person and we didn't actually finish it until yesterday because it was so much and so rich you had a few pieces, say, with a, a cup of tea or a few pieces in the evening after dinner and you were done. So, yeah, it does last. I uh, My favourite one from the range is the um, mint hard boiled egg, which is £15, but it's still a really substantial egg. Um, it's made with Tasmanian peppermint um, and 70% dark chocolate. So it's yeah, I I love dark chocolate with flavoring. I find yeah. you know with raspberry or orange or mint, it just kind of takes the sharpness away from the dark chocolate and that yeah, I really like that. I I ate the whole thing over the course of the weekend, which I wouldn't normally do with dark chocolate. So that was my favorite. Um and then there was a milk chocolate one, wasn't there? What did you think of that one? Yeah, good. I liked it. They had it had for me more so than the bigger ones that kind of classic Easter egg snap of the the chocolate when you broke into the egg, which I think they were really going for in that. So this milk chocolate one was slightly smaller and ten pounds, I believe. So a little bit more accessible. And I think that's probably what you're expecting to pay for an Easter egg from a chocolate specialist, I suppose. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm a fan of, of Hotel Chocolat's different chocolate options that they have for vegans. So they have obviously their really rich, dark ones, but I think they've got something really great in this milk chocolate they've developed. Um, again, a lot of people do just prefer that flavor to an, the intensity of a rich, dark chocolate. So great to have that option. Um, big fan. 
Yeah, it's a lovely, there's a lovely selection, really nice range. So um, yeah, go and have a look at their website and check them out to order in time for Easter. Um, if that is way above your price point, Aldi have launched their biggest ever Easter egg collection. Um, their own brand Easter eggs are $4.49 and they come with hazelnut truffles, which I'm excited to try. Mm. Um, and they're sort of different, the, the eggs themselves are different flavors. They're also um, selling the Moo Free Easter eggs, and I think they're three forty nine, so much cheaper. Um, and really worth a look. accessible. Have you tried uh, much of the Moo Free chocolate? I haven't myself. Yeah, I have. I mean, I, I feel like it's sort of aimed at a younger audience. Um, so I always buy them for my daughter. I mean, she's 14 now, so not quite as young as she was. But um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're really good. They're, they're nice. You know, it's um, not a luxury brand, obviously, like Hotel Chocolat. Um, it's a more accessible. Um, the eggs are sort of thinner. But yeah, good, good brand, definitely. I've also got my eye on a couple of the Nomo. Oh yeah, Easter yeah. eggs. I've seen those um, shared quite a lot on social. Um, I've seen a vegan haze. They call it hazelnut. Yeah, um, and the fruit crunch as well. And then I guess they're just standard creamy chocolate. Um, and they're more around the six or seven pound mark. So a bit more than Aldi, but definitely more accessible than um, the Hotel Chocolat ones. If that is a bit out of your price range. Maybe yeah. you gift the Audi ones and you treat yourself to a hotel chocolate. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> so today marks the launch of Fair Trade Fortnite, which obviously goes on for the next two weeks. Um, obviously not fully vegan related, but I think most vegans are very interested in the efficacy of their food, um, supply chains, you know, the treatment of um, workers and also the impact of their food on the environment. So um, it's definitely something to go and check out, um, get involved with. Um, do you kind of look for fair trade when you're out shopping? I have to be honest, I don't look for it as much as I would like to say that I do um, or as much as I think that I should. Um, and even just us kind of bringing up this fair trade fortnight has made me think gosh it's an element to the food that I buy or the shopping that I do that um, I probably don't give enough focus on so I guess in that way it's already doing its job raising awareness and and getting you to think um how about you yeah, I mean, I if I see the fair trade symbol, I would choose that product over another one. Um, the co-op is great for fair trade, mm. I find. Um, I mean, I've I've got one. It's not kind of my nearest supermarket and it's not a huge store. So I don't tend to shop in there a lot. Um, but, you know, yeah, I do kind of look for the symbol. But yeah, sometimes it's a lot to think about, isn't it? You're looking for the vegan symbol, you're looking for sometimes organic and then fair trade. And it's sometimes, yeah, a bit of a brain overload. Um, and especially for new vegans, I think, you know, even just working out, because obviously a lot of things aren't even marked vegan. They might be accidentally vegan. Um, mm. or, or, you know, they may, a lot of things say may contain traces of. So, you know, it's quite a minefield, isn't it? When you're new to veganism to kind of, navigate so um but yeah fair trade I think it's definitely something that um it's good to have awareness raised about um so yeah go and check out the website and um for sure and actually it's, it's something that I really consider outside of food so I'm definitely very uh, strict on myself I suppose about sustainability um fair trade workers rights when it comes to the clothes that I buy um clothes shoes things like that um so actually it's very nice to be reminded that I should be applying the same sort of care and thought to the food that I buy because so often you as you say you're already just searching for what you can and can't eat from a vegan perspective um but actually you can always do better, can't you? So yeah, nice covers, thing to consider. Covers such a wide, wide range of things, you know, coffee, wine, you know, a sort of um, crafts. 
um, mm. all sorts. So, um, well, my interview this week is with. Dr. Craig Rose, otherwise known as the Seaweed Doctor. And it's a really good one to listen to, Gabriella. It's um, it will make you be running out for seaweed <laughs> to add to everything. <laughs> I have to say, how topical, because this week I added seaweed flakes to my veggie Thai green curry. So I'm I'm right on trend with your interviews, Holly. <laughs> Very nice. Yes. I mean, yeah, it's a really interesting one. So um yeah, definitely have a listen um, wherever in the world you are. And don't forget to um, leave us that review on um, iTunes and follow us on social media at Simply Vegan Podcast and at Vegan Food and Living. And we'll see you next week. Well, as I said, for this week's interview, we're joined by Dr. Craig Rose, who is founder of Weed and Wonderful and Seaweed & Co. Thanks for joining us today, Craig. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. So you're known as Dr. Seaweed, is that right? (laughs) Yep, that's the name that's been given to me, yes. So where did your love of seaweed come from? How did it come about? Uh, so I, I did marine biology, so it's a proper doctor, it's a PhD doctor as, a, as opposed to a medical one. But so marine biology as a degree and then on and doing sort of more and more uh, degrees and research, in marine science, marine technology. And, and really, you know, I had a love of the sea anyway uh, from a young age, even though I grew up in Leeds, miles from the sea. I don't really know where it came from. I think it was Baywatch, actually. But um the, the 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 sort of interest in seaweed, I guess, came. I, I worked several years ago on a project looking at uh, biofuels, so producing fuel from seaweed, um, which is really interesting and something that may well happen in the future. But really, the the big impact I saw with seaweed was actually on food and nutrition, because it's very much a forgotten food. So mo- people still now think of it as something Asian, you know, sushi and Chinese food. But actually, every culture pretty much around the world at some point has used seaweed either to feed to livestock, to put on land or to eat ourselves because it's so abundant, it's so sustainable and it's so nutritious. So that sort of fascinated me. And then it was like, how do we take it in a sustainable way and put it into formats that people can really benefit from both nutritionally and and also make it very appealing and and attractive as, as a concept? So why is it so good for us? Uh, so the, first of all, I should say there's about 10,000 different types of seaweed in the world. So it's it's really diverse. So that, that's like, you know, and I will use the word seaweed flippantly uh, as if we're talking about all of them at one, as one, which we're obviously not. Um, but essentially, they're very, very mineral rich and they will absorb what is in the seawater and concentrate certain things and particularly with seaweed it's iodine and you need to be careful because some seaweeds are fairly moderate levels of iodine some can be extremely high so it's knowing what type of seaweed you're getting and making sure that that it is on the label particularly with things like nutritional supplements Uh, avoiding particularly things like kelps which can be quite cheap uh, imports uh, where the the levels of iodine can be extremely high Um, and and it is a a challenge because seaweed is this catch-all it's trying to say well actually you know all seaweed's good it's just some are better as uh, so a kelp can be great but it's not not too much so the, the one we focus on which is the, the latin name is ascophyllum nodosum or egg rack it's the one with the bobbly bits on that you'll see on the beach or similar to that and the iodine is the key thing whilst all the minerals are present in it and there's a lot of trace elements and and other things um iodine's key and particularly for vegans so actually seaweed is the only natural plant-based source of iodine and i say that and we've done a lot of work on this because the the traditional sources in the diet are fish and particularly white fish and then dairy and obviously that those aren't plant-based or or vegan sources of food Um, so unless you're having some sort of artificial supplement you won't get enough unless you eat huge amounts of things like nuts and certain green 
like terrestrial plants because there just isn't much if any iodine in them so if you are vegan it's very important there was a study out last year um saying that you know vegans understand b12 because it's very well discussed and they will supplement or, or have some sort of source in the diet but iodine is they're not really aware generally of a source of iodine and not that many people eat seaweed so it, it, unless you are taking artificial supplement and that we could go on to why natural is better than artificial seaweed is quite an important thing to have in your diet as as a vegan or, or even if you're flexitarian or you know whatever you choose to do if you are cutting out fish and dairy in any significant way then it's important you get a source of iodine from other places what what are the health implications then if you are low low or deficient in iodine so as we said iodine is essential you have to get it in your diet you can't sort of generate it or synthesize like vitamin d you get from the sunlight and in your diet iodine you have to get in your diet so essentially the the sort of six key things that we're allowed to talk about with iodine under eu and now uk law are that it supports your thyroid health so your thyroid's the gland that produces hormones as part of your endocrine system and the hormones are t3 and t4 and that three and four relate to the number of iodine atoms attached so if you don't get enough iodine you, you potentially can't produce enough of the thyroid hormones, which can lead to all sorts of health implications because your thyroid and the hormones are so important in wider function. Uh, it links to metabolism, so supporting your metabolism. So if your metabolism doesn't work right, you can find that you have difficulty losing weight because you, the efficiency of how you turn food into energy is not working quite right. And that leads to and things like hypothyroidism, so an underactive thyroid, one of the symptoms is difficulty losing weight or putting weight on, but other symptoms are like brittle hair and nails, sensitivity to cold, um, tiredness and fatigue. And, and people sometimes aren't aware, these are things you can live with and not really realize, you think I'm a bit tired and a bit run down. And we get so many anecdotally people who start to take it and it depends on your wider diet, but you, you within a few weeks, suddenly people's hair is thicker, the nails aren't splitting, they feel less tired, the skin is better. Skin is another one of the health claims that can make healthy skin. Nervous system, it benefits development in children. Iodine is essential during pregnancy. So the World Health Organization suggests having more during pregnancy because the fetus can't produce its own uh, thyroid hormones in the early stages, the mother has to do it. And there's been studies that, and this is actually very worrying, that women who are deficient in iodine during pregnancy uh, versus those that are sufficient, the, the resultant uh, children that are born have lower IQs than, than those who um, are sufficient because it is essential in fetal brain development. So it, it's an issue, and hopefully I'm not sort of sounding too passionate about it, but it's a real concern because this isn't just about vegans. Vegans are more susceptible because dairy and fish are the main sources. But in the, the UK is actually one of only two high income countries in the world with an iodine deficiency problem. Um, and that's really worrying. And it's because generally we have a poor diet. There's a big switch to plant based milks, which is great for all sorts of plant based reasons. But nutritionally, dairy does offer iodine um, because it's in the feed of the cattle. And for some, it's used to clean the teats and that come, uh, when the milking, it comes through into the milk. So, you know, it, th there is that nutritional argument there. And I, I know, obviously, dairy is, is, uh, has all sorts of negatives as well. Um, so, and cognitive function, that's another key area of iodine. And again, it often comes back to thyroid health. So I'd say you know, we, we get incredible testimonials as well as all the research we do with various universities on the benefits of the seaweed as a, as a natural iodine source, which people notice aesthetically in things like skin, hair and nails, but in the wider health, um, it, it's critical as well. Well, you've certainly convinced me. I think I'm going to be ordering some, some supplements tomorrow. <laughs> it is a worry, isn't it? And, and you know, I mean, like you say, with dairy, I think even if, I don't know, even if I wasn't vegan, I think I'd rather be getting iodine from a supplement or a, a natural source like seaweed rather than from the cleaning solution of, you know, that they use on udders or, or from the feed. Because obviously then you're just getting this, a supplement through the animal aren't you absolutely no definitely and that's not even though you know it's within a, a food product like uh, milk or cheese or whatever it is it's still like you say from an artificial source 
And the, the iodine used to be quite prevalent in topsoil, but it's it's just depleted over years. And that's one of the, the issues. So there are some, and we, we do the work, there's a, a book called uh, McCanson Widdison, I think is the name. And and that's where sort of DEFRA, the government, get get its its nutritional figures from. And when you look at plants, the, the amount, and some of this stuff's a bit outdated as well, the amount of iodine in plants is extremely low to the point of being negligible in the diet. So to be, from a, a legal point of view, to be able to say a product is a source of or good source of, that's the sort of terminology, any nutrient, in this case we're talking about iodine, you have to meet at least 15% of the RDA for, for um, a source of and 30% for a good source of, and anything over 30% is still a good source of. So to, for nuts, peanuts, are, I think, are the ones that the report is highest in iodine. Off the top of my head, so don't quote me because I can look it up, I think you need about 250 grams of peanuts to even be at a source of, so 15%. That, that's a lot of peanuts, and that's per day, um, whereas you need uh, less than half a gram to get 100% of your RDA, and in our capsules, half a gram is, is about 230% of your RDA. So, you know, it, it, it's key, you know, and, and as, as I mentioned, there's, there's lots of studies that show particularly those on a plant-based diet are much, much more at risk of, of being deficient in, in iodine. And through no fault of their own, it's just often it's, it's not a nutrient that's discussed particularly widely. So, I mean, if you're eating seaweed, what, you know, what's the best seaweed to go for? Because, um, I mean, that, like you're saying, they're not all sort of equal, are they? Um, and, it, you know, if we're having like nori wraps, for example, should we have those, like, look for the raw variety mm. or is roasted okay? Because a lot of them are roasted, aren't they? Yeah, so I think they're all good. And again, knowing the source is very important because much as seaweed will take up the nutrients from the marine environment, it will equally take up the contaminants. Um, so making sure it's from waters that are pristine or going to a brand that you know and trust is, is a good quality brand is, is very good. So nori is fantastic. It, it tastes good. It, it's so available now, whether that's, you know, there's all sorts of plant based or vegan sushis. There's, there's the roasted snacks, as you mentioned. I guess the downside of those is depending on your dietary choices that they're often uh, have a lot of oil on the, you know, or the, the fried sometimes or, and, or a lot of salt. Um, but that's good. They're relatively low in iodine compared to other seaweeds. Things like miso soup. So you have wakame seaweed in there. That's that's also good. Um, but these aren't necessarily things that people will have that often. Um, and that's why we developed the supplements we have. And that's taking the seaweed, um, the ascophyllum. It's all from the Hebrides in Scotland. So pristine waters. It's all harvested there sustainably. It's carefully dried and then it's milled to the powder. And really it's because people aren't really ready yet for a slab of seaweed on the plate. Um, so it's about putting it in that convenient form, putting it in a powder, putting it in a capsule, just one capsule a day, and you're getting what you need. And you can still have your nori and your wakame and, and your kombus and all the vast range. You know, seaweed is so diverse. Um, there's, there's lots of options. Um, and really, it comes down to, to preference and availability, which is often a challenge if you're shopping in normal supermarkets. Do you offer uh, one of the products that you do at the Seaweed & Co? Is um, is it an oil? We, we do. They, they are uh, sort of culinary uh, as opposed to nutritional. So what we did is we took a um, organic cold press rapeseed oil and we have a pure seaweed infused one, which is where we've then infused that oil with the seaweed. So, and, and again, it's great for vegans because you get this umami flavor from seaweed and it gives a flavor boost that uh, can be lacking. For example, if you're not having that meaty flavor that, that you would get, get from meat. So it can lift flavor. And, and we actually supply our, our seaweed as ingredients to a lot of food manufacturers and nutrition companies, as well as our own weed and wonderful products, as they're called. Um, and, and they use that for flavor enhancement. So, yeah, the oils are more about culinary benefits of seaweed. The weed and wonderful supplements are more about the nutritional benefits of seaweed. And, and I should say weed and wonderful. We call it that because we, we're really, I guess, addressing the elephant in the room that pe people do think seaweed is weird. And hence the weed and wonderful is a play on word saying it's not weird, it's wonderful. Um, so we really look to engage as much as possible with people's perceptions of seaweed. Increasingly, people know it's good. They might not know why. 
but for us it's about saying it's it's wonderful and, and here are some products to help you really engage with it yeah so how much seaweed is kind of recommended in a vegan diet should we be eating it every day or just um, once in a while I suppose if I flip it round to say how much of the nutrients should you have in in the diet as opposed to the seaweed um because i you know I, i'd certainly wouldn't want to imply that you know you can live off seaweed because uh, obviously you need lots of things um so because i mentioned the iodine is the key one um you need essentially at least 150 micrograms of iodine a day now one of our capsules for example which is half a gram of seaweed in a capsule provides around 230% of your RDA of iodine. Now, the, and it's about, not that it's relevant for vegans, but it's about equivalent to a portion of haddock, that, that amount of iodine, just to put it in context. So a tiny little capsule versus a portion of fish. Now, it is important in some of the research we've done to get more than your RDA, because as with any food, no one absorbs 100% of all the nutrients from that food, otherwise you'd never spend any time on the toilet. Um, so it, it especially with seaweed because it's quite high fiber so there's more than your rda there but that's just half a gram a day in a capsule that you can take very quickly um so so from our point of view that that should be a daily thing um to, to take one capsule a day i mean if, if you miss a day it's not, you know don't worry about it but it, it's something that's it's a, it's a routine to make sure you're getting that key nutrient yeah. And if people didn't want to take capsules and they wanted to eat seaweed, what, you know, are we talking perhaps a nori wrap a day or? Yeah, something like that. And and I guess, you know, like, uh, let's say it was wakame or, or, or kombu, which is a kelp, that might be something like if you have some miso soup um, or, you know, people do like the, the uh, sprinkles, like the flavors, sort of more culinary products, which is the dried seaweed to, to sprinkle on food. If you had that over a salad or in a soup or something like that that equally would, would give you a good amount. So you can do that mix. Or, or a lot of our customers, I'd say people don't always love supplements, but they might open the capsules and empty it into a smoothie or you know, a, a, a lentil bolognese or chili or something like that because it, it can enhance flavor as well as providing that nutrition. Okay, yeah, that's a good idea. I mean, what sort of seaweed dishes do you like to cook? With, with our oils, uh, there's a lot you can do because it's about flavor enhancement. So adding it to things where, let's say, tomato-based sauces, it really enhances flavor. So if you are making something like a bolognese or a chili or whatever the, the wider ingredients are, it can really boost flavor there. Um, it goes well with um, any, any sushi-type dishes. So if you do have rice and any, you know, and there's so many plant-based options to do there. And as I mentioned, we, because we supply ingredients into manufacturers, we do do a lot of work with plant-based companies where, for example, they'll make um, a plant-based fish alternative and it gives that flavor of the sea to the product. So there's companies doing like a sort of tin tuna type equivalent. Um, and obviously people go plant-based for a whole wet range of reasons. And it might be that you miss the flavor of, of tin tuna, for, for example. Um, because it might be more of an ethical stance or whatever it is. And, and so, you, as you will well know, there's so many options on the shelves now. And it's great that seaweed can play a part in that um, to, to provide everything from nutrition to, to flavours. Yeah, I like, um, I kind of whiz it up in a blender, like a nori wrap, and then um, do it like as chickpea tuna. So I add it to um, sort of crushed chickpeas with vegan mayonnaise, lemon juice, bit of Dijon mustard um trying to think if there's anything else like oh and garlic that's really good that oh, is good no and the flavors just go so well it's not and I think people because the perception sometimes is this slimy stuff on the beach it's it's getting people to overcome that it doesn't have that horrible you know like sort of sensation or or, or taste it's not something to be scared of you know it and the fact that it's eaten by so many cultures as a staple food hopefully shows that uh, it's not weird. And, and I get, we use analogies sometimes with things like hummus or chickpeas. You know, hummus was 20 years ago now, probably. It was seen as a very middle-class thing. It was only really, you know, Waitrose sort of fought it out. And, and it was a bit weird to most of us. And now it's Tesco's biggest selling dip. And that evolution, and, and the same with, with veganism, really. You know, obviously it's been around forever, 
but it's it's penetrated so incredibly well into mainstream diets, even for those sort of meat reducers, um, that it just becomes normal and 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 that's great. And that's where seaweed is. You know, it's the, that people know it as more of, a, of an Asian food, but increasingly we're seeing it more and more in some really really mainstream products because there's that real perception of health. Yeah, definitely. I read an article recently that discussed how seaweed absorbs 20 times more CO2 from the atmosphere than forests. Is it sustainable food of the future, do you think? No, absolutely. And I think, uh, I, I don't know the specifics on that statistic, but seaweed and algae generally. So algae covers all the microalgae, which you may have come across things like spirulina and chlorella. Um, so algae is a huge group that grows freshwater and marine. And seaweed's proper name is marine macroalgae. It's basically the big algae that grows in the sea. Um, and all of them absorb huge amounts of CO2, huge amounts. Just think of the, the scale of the ocean. Um, so there's, there's that aspect of it. It's a massive carbon sink. And so you end up, if we start to utilize it sustainably with like a short carbon cycle. So, so it absorbs it, we consume it release it and it absorbs it again you've got that really nice neat carbon cycle and what's more a lot of seaweeds will absorb nutri excess nutrients from the sea so good stuff that we need but where you get um there's a lot of work for example around fish farms where there's a lot of nutrients released for, because of the food and, and the waste that comes from the fish and that if it's not absorbed will can cause problems in the marine environment and seaweeds can absorb that so there's a massive sort of multifaceted benefits it can give to the wider environment and it is very sustainable. It grows incredibly fast. It, if, if you're getting it from the wild, which um, there's a balance between cultivated and wild harvest, it, it also uh, doesn't require fresh water, doesn't require land, doesn't require fertilizer. And those are three key problems with agriculture, that it needs those things and which makes it unsustainable. Um, so, yeah, it, it sort of ticks so many boxes that it absolutely is the sustainable food of the future. Another article I read was about seaweed being used for clothes to make to make clothing. How on earth does that work? <laughs> <laughs> it's not it's not it's not one that, that I am involved in, sadly. But yeah, it, the, the sort of functionality of seaweed. So everything from food, nutrition, biomedical applications, pharmaceutical applications and materials so bioplastics is another big area of work so the, the stuff uh, the, like polysaccharides for example from seaweed can be used to make bioplastics because remember oil uh, that's used for plastics is really just marine organisms seaweeds and other stuff that's just been left for millions of years to, to become oil so the, the stuff people are doing cleverer than me to create bioplastics to create other materials for things like clothing there was a fantastic artist um Julia Lohmann, she was called, and she set up, she's German, but she was based in London for a bit, the, uh, what was it called, the Department of Seaweed at the v &A in London. And I went to see her a few years ago, and she was making, for, for art, but some phenomenal stuff out of seaweed, hats, lampshades, beautiful stuff. But art often, you know, creates the trends and, and shows how it's done. And from there, we'll see other things come. But no, it, it really does tick everything from materials to, to all sort of health, nutrition and medical benefits, as well as fuel that we discussed at the start. Yeah, brilliant. Well, hopefully all those fish farms might end up getting replaced by seaweed farms in the next. <laughs> that is, <laughs> yes. And we're seeing that a lot. You know, we, Asia are light years ahead of us in terms of seaweed cultivation um, and like growing it in the sea. But it will come uh to europe and, and the west and, and there's a lot of work going on there and there's a nice story actually which um shows you know british ingenuity i guess there was a lady in the 1950s i think it was um called catherine Dr kathleen drew i think um and she it was quite rare anyway for, for women to be in in science and research in in the 50s no, with nori that you spoke about nori is now a humongous industry in in asia particularly japan and, and south korea and no one had yet worked out how to cultivate it so to go from the the sort of early juvenile stage to the finished plant there was a mystery in between so they had to rely on wild harvest and this lady worked out this link between the early stages juvenile stages to the finished plant um, and the story is it, it was on her windowsill by having tanks on the windowsill and working it out. Now, she published a paper 
that was read in Japan and they worked out how to then take it to commercial scale. Um, and that from that discovery uh, from a, a British lady back in the 1950s, this whole multi-billion dollar industry has grown. And there's actually statues of her in some towns and villages in Japan. And there's a, a, a national day, I believe. Um, so it's, you know, the, the, the ingenuity is there and, and it will continue to, to see this, this future sustainable food grown, uh, like you say, to replace fish, to replace all sorts of different food sources and, and other, other materials in a sustainable way. Well, thank you so much for chatting to me today. It's been absolutely fascinating. And um, yeah, I think everyone's going to either be ordering supplements or popping out for their nori wraps now. <laughs> Good. I hope so. No, thanks for having me. It's great to have the opportunity to, to talk to people. Well, if you've been inspired by today's episode, you can sample Weed and Wonderful's Pure Organic Seaweed Capsules for free for a 15-day trial. Um, visit veganfoodandliving.com to find the link. <laughs>